We are back. You are chatting with John P. Today we are going to be talking about some watches that receive a ton of respect from ultra high-end watch collectors. These are going to be watches that will feel very much at home among the watches that have really become ultra desirable in that high-end category. These are going to be people that collect the high-end independents like F.P. Journe, Kerry Voudelainen, um, Dave Bethune, and so many others, whether it's independent or even some that are not independent. But what I'm really saying is I'm going to be sharing with you the watches that are received very well by the most nuanced and most experienced watch collectors, right? Those that have probably spent a lot of time looking uh, at the movements and studying these types of things. So you can rest assured that if you have any of these watches in your collection, um, that you can wear it to a watch meetup or, or something like that. And I know not everyone really cares about, you know, impressing anyone, and that's not the point of this video, but instead it's to show watches that are not only potentially timeless, but also have some horological value in them more so than just, hey, this is the Rolex du jour of the time. These are going to be watches that are respected for what they are and, what, and how important they are in watches today and not necessarily something that's going to impress, um, you know, some wild watch collector. So don't take it that way. Today on the wrist, I have a brand new addition to my personal collection uh, brought over from a friend from Mexico that knows I love Anacar watches. I love this watch. I adore it. I just can't stop looking at it. Um, it's an Anacar Sherpa Super Dive. I'll try to get Yep, here on the camera, but um, if you check out my Instagram, the real John P, the real John P here below, check it out on Instagram. I post pictures of the watches that I'm wearing and kind of a little bit behind the scenes at Delray Watch, where we buy, sell, trade watches, delraywatch.com, where the team has been working around the clock bringing very cool watches for you. So let's jump into the list before we lose you. The first watch is actually going to be a, um, a bit of a trick watch. This it doesn't count for the official list, but this is going to be an Apple Watch. Now, myself personally, I don't have an Apple Watch. I don't wear an Apple Watch. But because I'm a watch trader and dealer and I do some consulting and I also curate some private collections, I would just want to share with you the fact that I experience so many ultra high-end complicated watch collectors wearing the Apple Watch. Now, they might be wearing the Apple Watch in conjunction with whatever watch that they want to enjoy for the day, whether it's a Jorn or something else uh, like an Elangun Zona, uh, which is something I see all the time. But, you know, you wear those watches, they're not really appropriate for all the settings. It means certain things to certain people, and also they're much more delicate than something like an, an Apple Watch, right? You're not probably not going to go for a run with an FP Jorn um, on your wrist, though you might, right? Technically, they have a sports line. Um, but what, what I'm getting at is I was actually shocked. You know, the more I get into this, the more people that I meet, the more collectors that I meet, uh, meetups and people that I work with, I'm seeing a lot more people start to wear the Apple Watch. A few years ago, this was kind of the kiss of death for watch collectors. You'd see an Apple Watch and, you know, maybe, maybe a watch uh, savant, I guess you'd call them, would, you know, I don't want to say uh, look down on it, but they'd say, yeah, maybe this person's not a watch guy. Now I have, for example, uh, a, now a friend who will show up at our office with an entire Pelican case of Elangun Zona watches and some complicated Jorns and be wearing an Apple watch or no watch at all. So I think the mold is kind of breaking there as we see more people look at watches as asset classes or collectibles more so than something to wear uh, every day. We're seeing more people hold in to that kind of Apple Watch, smartwatch platform, and I think that's really just a, a sign of the times, right? Including no watch um, because you have a phone. So I think it's a sign of the times more than something that denotes a watch collector, and I just really wanted to share, with, uh, share that with you because I'm seeing it much more often. But the first actual watch that I'm seeing uh, a lot more watch collectors that would really only focus on the big ones put... Grand Seiko into their watch collections. Now, if you're familiar with, with watches by now or you're here on the internet, the chances are pretty good, but Grand Seiko has been doing a lot of great things, especially in the U.S. market. They've done others in other markets, but when they've entered the, the U.S. market here within the last decade and really made a great push the last couple of years, they've been doing a lot of great things, releasing a lot of limited watches with beautiful dials, which they're really known for, as well as the Jiratsu finishing on the uh, the watch cases, which is something, you know, similar or reminiscent of 
you know, some people like to say like a Japanese sword or a katana or something along those lines. It gives you that feeling and that's something special that they've been able to kind of pair with the brand to kind of get people in the door and develop a name for themselves in that kind of special way with that kind of artisanal Japanese craftsman uh, feeling to the watches. And it, it looks very much that way with some of the, the beveled edges kind of almost reminding you of something you would see in like a sword or a samurai movie, at least in my head. Um, but I'm seeing a lot more people that would have probably stuck to the rare Rolexes, think vintage, stuck to more unique pieces, auction pieces, stuck to things from independent manufacturers, the FP Jorns, Kerry Voodalinens, those types of uh, high-end limited production watches, even throw in Parmigiani Fleurier, certain pieces that are a little bit more limited in production. Uh, but I'm seeing a lot more of these of these collectors actually pick up Grand Seiko, and it makes sense because of the finishing and the polishing. I was at an event uh, probably about a year ago now, right? It was a year ago in Florida. They had events then, and this was like a watch event. And th there was a, sp a specific gentleman that had the Grand Seiko watch, and he had a, a lot of other very sophisticated pieces. I believe a, a couple of Elon Gunzonas and Jorns and some Patek Philippe's. I believe a Grand Complication he had. I can't remember which one, but he also went along the lines of talking about the Grand Seiko. And for him, it was about the dial. I believe it was about the dial, the uniqueness about the dial, and the rest of the watch you know, wasn't too far removed for the independence that he had in his collection. Now, of course, there's going to be a, a lot more machining and tooling that's used in the Grand Seiko than the, the hand construction on some of these independents, but quality is quality and the results are results. So when you're looking at a watch like that, it's really nothing that you can shake a stick at and it's approachable, right? By the way, the watches I'm going to be talking about are approachable. Um, something I want to mention is it's not the same as affordable. These are going to be watches the rest of the list, including Grand Seiko, a few thousand dollars and under you can pick them up. So that's what I like to think approachable. Some might have to save up a little bit, but um, certainly they are you know, approachable by most people, depending on where you live in the world. But Grand Seiko is one that I think we're going to see more and more people put them in their collection. And the prices are going up the retail prices as Grand Seiko starts getting more towards that kind of independent platform uh, with higher prices and hand craftsmanship that we're seeing. So Grand Seiko, uh, number one on the list, and I do recommend checking out the brand in mechanical offerings or quartz if you prefer, but it's a different ball game. Next, we have Vintage. And this is going to be a vintage date just. I see so many ultra high end watch collectors that might just slap a vintage date just on the wrist because it's something perhaps their wife bought them decades ago, or it was, you know, it's a watch that really didn't have alternatives for the time. Think 40 years ago. How many independents did you have? A lot of brands were technically independents because the major watch houses hadn't purchased them yet. Uh, but if you think about them in terms of today's uh, market, really not independent, but you know, by today's standards, I guess you'd call them that. But there really weren't a lot of alternatives, right? You wanted a nice watch, you bought yourself a Rolex. There was others out there, some Cartier watches and things like that, but really Rolex was there where it was at. So people would buy the presidential, the day date, or people would buy a day just, and that would be the nice watch of the time. Or maybe a Patek Philippe or a Vacheron, but generally people walked into an AD, uh, go figure, you could walk into an AD, but people would walk into an authorized dealer and buy these watches and it's just some watch collectors and I'm sure in the comments below there are many of you that will chime in. It's just been on the wrist for a decade, two decades, three decades and it's never left the wrist, the wrist and it's just a comfortable wear. You get used to it and it's just a habit more than anything and it's timeless. And that's something that I think watch fellow watch savants and geeks can really look and, and nod at each other whether it's a young guy that picked up a vintage date just because maybe it's a little bit more approachable in terms of price point, or whether it's someone that's had the watch in their family or in their personal collection for decades, it can mean different things to different people, and it's certainly not riding the, 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 the coattails or the trends of the day. It's something that should remain for quite a long time as long as, as watches are a thing. So the Rolex Datejust in vintage is something that I think gets a lot of respect from um, all kinds of watch collectors across the board. Next, we have the Omega Speedmaster. Now, there are many variations of the Speedmaster, and depending on, depending on the price point that you want to get into, this can change, right? You have the rarities, you have the watches from the Gemini series, you have the Snoopy getting into modern times, but there are so many 
Omega Speedmasters, right? But one thing is for certain is you can spot an Omega Speedmaster. You can spot it on the wrist. I was actually, uh, I was walking out of some place last Sunday and I spotted right away a lady was wearing a, an, an Omega Speedmaster and a conversation was striking up about it and she went on to talk about how in fact the watch was just so rugged and durable. She loved it, she owned other watches, she owned Rolex, but she just loved wearing that particular Speedmaster and setting aside you know, those comments that she made. And I, and I had to assume, you know, she wasn't, you know, she's probably not watching this video. She's not a watch collector, just liked a nice watch. The Speedmaster is an icon, right? And that's something that comes with respect among watch collectors. When you, when you gain a little bit of um, knowledge and you get in there and you learn about the history behind the horology and what makes certain things important in watches, the Speedmaster hits the list. Speedmaster Professional, you know, was in space. It was on moon. It was in, it was approved by NASA and so many other countless reasons. It's been part of the Olympics. It's been part of so many things in history. And when something has been part of so many things in history and on the wrists of so many people, people that have done things that makes for a nice watch, a nice story. And that's what watches are generally about, right? Look at new brands that come out. They have to make up stories because they're competing with the Omega Speedmasters of the world, right? You get a new micro brand, they talk about, you know, how their grandfather was in the Battle of the Bulge and, you know, the watch is inspired by the helmet he wore, all these types of things because they have to compete with the Omega Speedmasters of the world. So between watch collectors, the Speedmaster gets the nod. You see a lot of watch collectors, a lot of watch snobs, a lot of savants. They like the Speedmaster and it makes sense. I love the Speedmaster myself. Next, we have a Cartier tank. And I think if we're talking in terms of approachability, they have the more entry level line, the tank solo, which is very classic. And it looks like that classic Cartier tank that you, uh, I'm sure you all know because it's an icon in its own regard. In terms of that style, that rectangle watch, the Cartier tank has been doing this for such a long time. And it's become almost synonymous with dress watch, right? You put on a Cartier tank, you wear it to a black tie, you wear it to the office, you wear it to things that require, or maybe are suggested in today's kind of casual nature of things. You wear this watch to weddings, you wear this to something that requires a little bit of sophistication, or you're wearing a suit. That's generally what these are for, and throughout time, that's also been the case. And not a lot has changed in terms of a dress watch, and the Cartier tank and the tank solo particularly, sure, they've changed up the profile a little bit, the mechanics behind it, as well as some dial changes. And, you know, now they have, you know, the Cartier tanks that are solar powered, um, supposedly, and the quartz watches as well. But the tank solo is something, or the tank rather, that you can wear and it makes sense, right? It's a watch that you see and it's like, I know why that person has the watch in their collection. There's nothing that has to be explained necessarily unless it's personal, a personal you know, keepsake or memento or something that's been passed down um, perhaps in your family or, or a gift. That can be a story, but aside from that, it's not like there's something very special or unique about that model other than it's iconic, right? And that's something, once again, it's that the, the recognizability of the watch universally, almost everywhere, in the world, as long as you know you're somewhat familiar with this sector, let's put it, you know, luxury goods and, and that type of a thing, it's recognizable, almost as recognizable as a Rolex at this point. So the Cartier tank, um, not only do I recommend it for all the things that I mentioned, uh, I know that many other people recommend it as well, and it's nice to have in your collection. And lastly, I'd like to mention this for it's 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 probably the most approachable on the list, although this brand has moved up market in recent years uh, with the rest of the watch industry, if we have to be honest about it. And this is a Nomos and particularly something like the Nomos Club. Now I've owned Nomos personally myself. I don't have a Nomos in my collection right now because I try to limit it to watches that I will wear frequently. And, but when I did have a Nomos, I wore it all the time and it had the Alpha Caliber movement, right? So when we're talking about Nomos watches, Nomos is a brand you can get into for in-house production, in-house movements, and have a quality 
German made watch that doesn't really have much that it's leaving off the table, right? Sometimes when you get into a, a watch that's at this price point around 1000 US dollars, maybe 1200, I think with price correction and adjustments uh, between countries. But when we're getting into watches at this price point, sometimes you have to leave things out, right? You know, maybe you're not getting an in-house movement. Maybe you're, you're, you're opting in for a Salita or an Etta movement or a Peso movement, a manual wound movement uh, owned by Etta now. Uh, or maybe you're missing out on that recognizability, right? You buy a micro brand, it's not gonna have that recognizability among watch collectors unless they spend all day on the internet like we do, right? <laughs> it's, kind of, it's kind of interesting like that. But when you get into the Nomos brand, it's really become widely accepted and widely known with inside watches. And so when we look at the original goal here of to have necessarily a watch, and it might not be a goal of yours, but perhaps someone, a goal to have a watch that is going to be recognizable among watch collectors, strike up a conversation, whether it's at a meetup or an event or at a coffee shop, depending on where you live, the Nomos goes a long way. And considering you can get in there maybe 1200 US dollars less if you get into the pre-owned market, places like Delray Watch. That's a really great price point to have a seat at the table. I think sometimes, not I think, I know sometimes because I get so many questions and comments on my Instagram, uh, the real John P for the most part, or phone calls at Delray. Sometimes people feel like either they're missing out or they don't have a seat at the table. In a world where, you know, Jorns are sometimes selling for several times Retail Rolex several times retail price. Some watches you just you just can't get when you get into high-end independent manufacturers. And even if you if you can, they're at these exorbitant price points that are not able to be obtained by everyone uh, or most people for that matter. If we have to be honest about it, some some collectors kind of feel like they're missing a seat at the table. But when, when we talk about a watch like Nomos, I do believe that it allows everyone to have a seat at the table of a watch brand that does really great things for the watch enthusiasts predominantly and almost only. I don't know many casual watch buyers that walk in and buy a Nomos. They might buy a Tissot, which does some interesting things as well, or perhaps a Hamilton, but I don't know, and I've never heard of anyone walking into an authorized dealer and saying, oh, that's a lovely watch, I'm gonna buy that. I've not heard of a situation. It's always someone that loves the watches, the passion, the horology, and that's a selling point from the authorized dealer as well. The in-house movements, the interesting kind of story, how it's still unfolding and developing, that's very cool, and I think that is what watches is all about. And with a brand like Nomos and some of the more approachable models they have, it's almost like an equalizer, and it's very cool because that brings in unique perspectives, and I love hearing about that. What do you guys think? Are there any other watches or brands or models that you believe really are either great conversation starters or just a way for more people to get involved as like a watch savant or a watch enthusiast, but at an approachable price point? I would love to hear this. Please leave this in the comments below. Thanks guys, you've been chatting with John P. Ciao.